Hey, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the books that I, I read when I was here. You know, because in the video that I was talking about that, uh, the video cut off at first and it started recording from the part when I said about Leon Trotsky. So it looks like I only read Leon Trotsky and that's not the case. No, I read um, one very good book, which is uh, a biography, a, a experience of a gay man, a German gay man that went through the Nazi concentration camps. That was a really good book. Um, I read The Diary of Anne Frank. Uh, I read, um, uh, let's see, I read uh, Quotations of German Mao, finally. I read it back to back, Quotations of German Mao. I read a bunch of uh, uh, like essays uh, from Ho Chi Minh. I read uh, an ideology textbook from uh, People's Korea. And uh, I, you know, the ideology textbook from People's Korea it describes the, the philosophy of Juste, which is the, the uh, People's Korea version of Marxism. Um, yeah, and that was really interesting. After reading that book, I no longer use the term North Korea to describe uh, People's Korea because uh, the reality is that uh, People's Korea is the legitimate government of the whole peninsula, but the United States occupies the southern part and set up a puppet government as a front. So to, if you call it North Korea, you are legitimating the American occupation, the illegal American occupation of the southern half of the Korean peninsula. And I'm not gonna do that anymore. So for now, I call it People's Korea. And uh, let's see. Oh, I read, uh, I read Socialism and Man in Cuba by uh, Ernesto Che Guevara in Spanish, that was really good. I read, um, yeah, uh, I already mentioned Ho Chi Minh. Oh, I read a bunch of speeches from uh, Joseph Bros Tito. That was interesting. I've never really gotten into Tito before. And now I, I sort of like uh, read his stuff and I, you know, I, he's, yeah. Hmm. Uh, in Socialist Federal Yugoslavia, they exper they had like, their version of workers' control between 1950 and 1980, at least. And, you know, that is the only time in history that workers' control has been experimented with on an, like an economy, political economy-wide basis. So that was really interesting. But, you know, looking at criticism of it from the Trotskyist and uh, Marxist-Leninist perspective is more cogestion rather than workers' control. But, you know... At least there, once for 30 years, that was tried, and you have a, a sort of like a, a um, what did you call it? An empirical, like, uh, you can make an empirical test of it, or like, uh, you know, evaluate it empirically to see if it's really workers' control or whatever. Uh, you know, workers' control has, has also been tried in Argentina after the uh, Argentinazo of 2001, and in Venezuela under Hugo Chavez, there were experiments with workers' control. And in Argentina, of course, fa it's very famous, La Sobrera Sin Patron, the, uh, the, the women workers without bosses, right? That, uh, yeah. So I got into this whole issue of workers' control, uh, criticism and like whatever, evaluations and criticism of it. Um, yeah, um, yeah, you know, um, what other books did I read here? I read several other books. Um, yeah, uh, there was one book I looked at. I didn't read the whole of it, but it's like a, a, a queer Marxist. Uh, no, it's like a Marxist perspective on queer history that I got from Workers, Workers World Party. Uh, from their uh, ebook uh, section, that was pretty good. Um, because in June it was the Stonewall thing, so in June I was focused on, on LGBTQI plus history. So I read uh, anything Marxist. I read, I found that Marxist book, and I found some other books about LGBTQI history, queer history, and um, I got into the whole issue of queer theology, queer theology. And that led me to Metropolitan Community Church on Facebook. Um, right. Uh, queer theology. What else did I get into while I was here? Um, yeah. 
yeah, I cannot, I cannot think of anything else. But yeah, I read, oh yeah, I read this book. It was this this uh, textbook for, for, from the Soviet Union called Fundamentals of Marxist-Leninism. And that was an interesting book, you know. I understand now official Marxist-Leninism. I don't agree with all of it, but I understand what official Marxist-Leninism was. And I understand why official Marxist-Leninism called the Soviet Union existing socialism, which I don't agree the Soviet Union was socialist. I don't, I don't agree the Soviet Union achieved social, socialism, and I do not agree at all that the Soviet Union ever achieved communism. That is a lie. The Soviet Union was not communist. Communism has never been achieved. It, communism on the basis of an industrial basis has never been achieved anywhere, okay? Industrial communism based upon an industrial base has never been achieved anywhere. Uh, it's certainly not in the Soviet Union or Eastern Bloc. I think that the only countries that got close to a sort of like developed socialism were East Germany and Socialist Federal Yugoslavia in some aspects, but not entirely. So, yeah. And by, by, by certainly Cuba is not communist because Cuba has never even achieved socialism yet. So Cuba is still working on socialism. And the way it looks now, they're adopting the Vietnamese model. So first they need to develop and grow their economy by going through a Vietnamese, uh, a Vietnamese phase. And then perhaps if the economy is developed, assuming they can get rid of the embargo, you know, end the stupid the Amer the imperialist embargo, or find a way to dodge the worst of it, then maybe Cuba could achieve a semblance of socialism. And then out of that could emerge communism, but that's far ahead into the future. I don't think Cuba is anywhere near any of that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to talk about a little bit more about other things I read um, while I was in here. Um, Jesus, what else did I read? Oh, theologically, of course, I read J.J. Altisor, I think is his name. He's like the main... Uh, uh, the main ex, like the main exponent of uh, Christian atheism. Uh, Christian atheism, of course, is you walk with Jesus in a godless world. So Jesus, the historical Jesus existed, and he expressed an ethics that is valuable, but there is no God. Uh, so the true God does not exist, and I can agree with that for a different reason. That is not Christian atheist, but yeah, okay. Uh, you know the 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 joke. That old joke from uh, that Australian philosopher, his name escapes me, that, you know, a, a creator that does not exist, uh, no, what was it? Uh, that a creator that does not require existence is greater than one who does, or something to that effect. So that's why you could say that the true God does not exist. You could say that. If you assume that joke to be like a premise or whatever. Um, in the description, whether, whether this is on Rumble, Facebook or YouTube in the description I'll put the name of the guy he's an Australian philosopher his name escapes me and uh, what's his name uh, Richard Dawkins in the God Delusion mentions him but yeah um, Gaskin something Gaskin I forgot the first name but yeah anyways um, yeah so I got into Christian atheism and I became converted to Christian atheism so I am now Christian atheist who is a fellow traveler of Mormon Worker, Community of Christ, and Metropolitan Community Church. And again, I the ethics of the historical Jesus are okay. If you assuming you can trust the the gospel narratives, and you know, I continue to say that the Book of Mormon is a true testimony, that the Book of Mormon is a true instrument of restoration, and that that the Book of Mormon is a true uh, witness of Jesus Christ. I have no problem with the Book of Mormon. I love the Book of Mormon. In fact, I read a lot of the Book of Mormon here. I finally found out the theological basis for Mormon soteriology. Uh, I discovered that in the Book of Mormon. Uh, I read that. And of course, it was listening to sermons from Community of Christ that I jotted down, you know, whatever, what to read, and I looked it up, and I found that. So I, I'm done with the primitive Mormon soteriology as understood by Joseph Smith, okay? Now, there has been soteriological developments. If you go in the LDS Christian route or the Community of Christ route or, you know, the, um, the, there is this, this Mormon primitivist uh, congregation in a place called Independence, Missouri, and I attended some of their, uh, I attended some of their services virtually. 
and that was pretty interesting. Um, Mormon primitivist. They're trying to be like they're trying to recreate the Mormonism that existed between 1830 and 1844. Okay, more power to them. Um, you know, I think that uh, that is uh, the be I think that instead of looking for the primitive church in the past, you need to look for the primitive church in the here and now here. So that's the only thing. Um, because if you start looking for the primitive church in the past, you will become reactionary. Not, and, and that's not a good thing. Um, I mean, you cannot recreate. I mean, we are not in the period. We are not in the 1830s. You know, we're in the 2020s. You know, so the theology and soteriology, ecclesiology, eschatology, you know, Christology of that era does not fit now. You know, because we don't live in that era. So if you articulate that theology now, it will be incomprehensible because it's out of context. It will be an anachronism. So, uh, yeah, but, but I, I, I went ahead and attended their services several times on, on, on you, there on YouTube, whatever. And I went there and I listened to their sermons and whatever. It was cool. It's, you know, I have no problem with them. Uh, and then, um, yeah. Uh, what else happened? Oh, yeah, I got this really cool, I got a facsimile of the 1611 King James Bible, and I looked, with, including the Apocrypha, and I read uh, The Wisdom of Solomon. That was a really, really interesting book. Um, Wisdom of Solomon, that was more theological stuff. But, yeah. Uh, did I say I, I read quotations of Chairman Mao from back to back? I actually did. I think I already mentioned that, but I just want to make sure. I read it, finally. I, got, I sat down and I read quotations with Chairman Mao from back to back. And now I understand the, the psychology of, of Chairman Mao. Because Chairman Mao put that together for a reason. Or like the people, his aides or whatever, whoever put it together, put it there so that you could capture the, uh, the, the, the perspective and mindset of Chairman Mao. So now I understand Mao. I understand how Mao thought. I understand Mao thought, right? So that was good. So just like I understand official Marxist-Leninism, I understand official Mao thought, and I understand Trotskyism. You know, so because like I said in that other video, I reread The Revolution Betrayed for the third, fourth, or, no, third time. First I read it in 2010, then I read it when I was in the IMT in 2021, and again now. So it's the third time I read The Revolution Betrayed. It's like I know the book already, like, yeah, okay. You know, it was really interesting. But every time I've read it, though, I've read it through a different lens. So I get something different out of it. So that's interesting. But anyways, yeah. So that, that's a little bit more on what was cut off about literature that I read. While in the uh, Migraciones uh, uh for Varsen Hetten, right? So, bye.